in the previous lecture, we just got a, a brief introduction to TCP. Uh, I think everyone has seen some parts of TCP, be TCP before. Uh, today, we're going to go through flow control. And then after that, we'll go through congestion control. So the two different features we'll go through separately. In fact, they are related. Uh, they'll, when they're both used, they may impact upon each other. Flow control, we finished within the last uh, lecture, uh, is the idea that the source computer sending data to the destination computer, the destination computer has a certain amount of buffer, which is memory inside that computer, allocated to receive packets. So as the destination receives packets, TCP segments, it puts them into the buffer, and then the computer, the CPU, goes to work, does some processing, and eventually sends to the application. That takes some time. The problem, or a potential problem, is if the source computer is sending so fast such that the receiver receives TCP segments and is putting them in the buffer and is slow to process them, the amount of memory allocated is limited and eventually fills up and the receiver will have to drop segments which is bad for performance because dropping segments between source and destination means retransmissions are needed which means uh, longer delay and lower throughput. So the idea is in flow control and TCP is to avoid that situation. And the way to avoid it is quite simple the receiver tells the sender how much space it has available in its buffer. So if we have a thousand bytes available in the receiver buffer to receive a thousand bytes of data, the receiver somehow has to tell the sender, I've got 1,000 bytes available, and the receiver will not send more than 1,000 bytes. And if at a later stage, more space becomes available at the receiver because the the data that's been already received is processed, and now we have 10,000 bytes available at the receiver, then somehow the receiver needs to tell the sender, I've now got 10,000 bytes of space available, and the sender can send up to 10,000 bytes of data. So the receiver controls the flow of data from the sender. We don't have many lecture notes or in the, this set of lecture slides. There's not nothing on flow control, but there's another handout that you have that we'll go through that explains with a detailed example flow control. But before we go through and explain how it works, let's just remind ourselves in every TCP segment, we have the source and destination port, a sequence number, and some other fields. Importantly, in our flow control, we have a window field. It's 16, 16 bits long, okay? So we've got a four byte, uh, two byte window field, 16 bits. This is used, the value in there is used by the receiver to tell the sender how much space it has available in its buffer. So source sends data to the destination. Destination knows how much space it has in its received buffer. Let's say it's a thousand bytes. And when the, that node sends an acknowledgement back, including this TCP header, inside the window field it sets the value to indicate I have 1,000 bytes available in my buffer. And that way the source knows how much available space and how much it's allowed to send. So the window field in the segment is used to indicate back to the source how much space the receiver has in its buffer. We're going to go through an example with some pictures from a different handout. Uh, you have them where? In this handout, TCP bandwidth delay product and TCP, or the bandwidth delay product, BDP 
So you have this handout in front of you in, in your lecture notes. We're going to go through some pictures from there just to explain how flow control works. Here's one of the pictures, a diagram to illustrate a very basic flow control uh, that is used in TCP. We have a client and a server. So the client wants to send data to the server in this case. Source, destination, sender, receiver, client, server. Okay. And across some internet. Okay, so there may be multiple links between client and server. And in general, with what we do is we, instead of, uh, go back, in a stop and wait protocol, we can send one data frame one data segment, and then we must stop and wait and wait for an app to come back, and then we can send another one. TCP uses what's called a sliding window mechanism, which allows the source, the client, to send multiple data segments, and then it eventually, once it reaches a limit, it must wait for acts to come back, and then it can send more data segments. So this is just showing that general mechanism where in this simple case, the client sends four data packets, data segments. They propagate across the network. It takes time, so the client transmits a data segment. It takes time to get to the server. When the server receives it, it may send back an acknowledgement segment. So it sends back a short ACK. And when we, while we're waiting for the ACK, the client can send a second data segment, and a third and a fourth, in this example. So in this example, the client was allowed to send four data segments, and then after sending four, it's not allowed to send any more, until it receives an ACK for the first one that it's already sent. And the ACK indicates of that the server has successfully received, and that's an indication that we can send more data. It, the server's ready to receive more. And then we send more, and then we have to wait for acts again, and this can continue. So this is a general illustration of the sliding window mechanism where, or the windowing where the client can send a window of segments, more than just one. How many can it send? Well, that's how well, TCP flow control controls how many it's allowed to send. It depends upon the receiver buffer space at the server. So how many segments, or more precisely, how many bytes is, can the client send before having to wait for the next ACK? That's the question. Well, the server will tell the client how many bytes it's allowed to send by including in the ACK a, in the window field, the number of bytes it's allowed to send. And if we've sent that many, then we're not allowed to send any more. So, for example, let's say in this case we're allowed to send four, four segments. We send the first one, so we're allowed to send three more. We send the second one, we're allowed to send two more, one more. After we've sent that fourth segment, we're not allowed to send any more until the server says we're allowed to send more. So the server sends an act back saying, now you're allowed to send one more segment. So inside the act, there'll be a value that indicates how much it's allowed to send. We send one more segment, and just after sending that, we receive a second act back saying, you can send one more segment. And we transmit that segment, and then we receive the third act back, that acknowledgement for the third segment sent, and we send another, and so on. So that's hopefully a reminder of some of the basics of a sliding window mechanism. Any questions, any issues? I know most of you have covered sliding windows in uh, my previous course. We want to see how TCP implements this and how it impacts on performance. So the amount that the client's allowed to send before it receives an ACK is determined by the buffer space at the server. 
if we draw that, let's find a pen. The server has an amount of buffer allocated for the TCP connection. That is, the server has some memory okay, in the oper operating system allocates some memory for the data that it receives. As it, the server receives data segments, it puts them in the buffer and they may stay there until the application at the server takes the data out, processes it. So flow control is about making sure that we don't overflow this buffer. So what we do is when the server sends back an ACK, the TCP header, the window field, indicates how much space is available in the buffer. So if we start, for example, with a buffer of 10,000 bytes, and currently we've, we're storing, I don't know, 3,000 bytes of data is stored in the buffer, then when the server sends back an ACK in the window field in that TCP header, it will set the window value to be, so it sends back a, a TCP ACK, and the window field will equal 7,000. Saying, I've got 7,000 bytes of space available in my buffer, you're allowed to send me up to 7,000 bytes of more data. If you send me more than 7,000, you'll fill up my buffer, buffer, and that's a problem. Okay, so the window field restricts how much the source is allowed to send. And then the, the client, when they receive that, uses that value, and based upon how much they've already sent, they can determine how many more data segments they can send. Note that TCP, we don't count the data segments, we count bytes. So this is indication you're allowed to send 7,000 bytes. You, whether you send that in one segment or in two segments or 10 segments, it doesn't matter as long as the amount of data is no more than 7,000 bytes. So that's the basics of TCP flow control. Uh, and of course, these values will change over time. If we send more data and this 3,000 bytes is still in the buffer, and we send, let's say we send another 1,000 bytes, so it increases up to, the amount of buffer in use increases up to 4,000. Then the act that comes back, the next act, would have a window of what? 6,000. So it was 3,000 in use with 6,000 spare. If we receive another 1,000 bytes of data sometime later, we've got 4,000 bytes in use, 6,000 bytes spare, so we send back an act saying my window size is 6,000 bytes, meaning the client is not allowed to send more than 6,000 bytes. Now, how does this number go down? Well, this is the buffer that the operating system maintains for TCP, for data received. There's an application on this server that consumes this data. So it's, we're sending data, TCP stores it in a buffer until the application takes it out of, out of the buffer and uses it. So the application, depending upon what it's doing and the speed of the computer, may eventually take data out of the buffer making more space available. For example, the application takes 3,000 bytes out of the buffer, that data has been successfully delivered. So now TCP has 1,000 bytes stored in the buffer. The next act that goes back will be 9,000. The server will tell the client, I now have space for another 9,000 bytes. You can send me up to 9,000. You, the, the buffer, uh, TCP allocates a buffer for each connection. So we'll see some values shortly. 
So when you create a TCP connection, an application creates a connection, it allocates, let's say, 60,000 bytes for buffer for the receiver. Okay? If you have multiple connections running, you have a separate buffer, independent. Okay? So the server, let's say it's a web server and hundreds of people are connecting to it at the same time, then there are hundreds of TCP instances running in parallel, all independent of each other and all having their own uh, buffer. So it's per connection. Okay, any questions on how the basics of TCP flow control work? Now, it's hard to predict when this value goes up and down because when does the application take data out of the buffer? It depends upon the application. It depends upon the speed of the computer, how long it takes to process. So we do not know how, how fast in, in practice that happens. But just in TCP, the basic procedure is that as we receive data, we put it in the buffer, and the window size that goes back is of course going to be smaller because we've got less space in the buffer. As data is taken out of the buffer by the application, we can advertise a larger window because we've got more space in the buffer. And what's happening is that the server is advertising the amount of space available in its buffer, amount of memory. And hence, this is called the advertised window. The server advertises, it tells, informs the client how much space it has available. So this is often referred to as the advertised window. And that limits how much the client is allowed to send. This diagram is just a simplification of the previous one. I've just removed the, the lines or the arrows for all of the frames except the first, and I've simplified the acts. Usually the acknowledgments are small and take a, a small amount of time. Now we know the basics of TCP flow control, we're interested in understanding how it impacts on performance. When I'm transferring files or a, a large amount of data from my client to server, how fast can I send that? Well, the TCP flow control mechanism impacts upon the speed because how much data can the client send? It depends upon the advertised window. The advertised window, this value, say, of 7,000, limits the amount of data that the client can send before it has to wait for another act. In this case, it can send 7,000 bytes. After it sends 7,000 bytes, it must wait until it receives more information from the server. So if we have to wait a long time, then our throughput will go down because we send 7,000 and then wait a long time. So we don't want to look and analyze how does this impact on our throughput or our performance. Let's look at it in a, a general sense and then go through a detailed example. In, in a simple case, it primarily the performance primarily depends upon how fast we can send data and the time to get an acknowledgement back. So in this diagram, although we don't have numbers, let's say the the client is allowed to send this, this amount of data. So this indicates the transmission time. Four, four segments here. Let's say each segment was 1,000 bytes. That's 4,000 bytes it's allowed to send. So initially it sends its 4,000 bytes. It will not be able to send any more until it receives some acknowledgement from the server saying, my advertised window has increased. Let's put some numbers to this. You can draw on that diagram. The client and the server 
the advertised window needs some initial value. Let's say it's initially 4,000 to get started, which means the client is allowed to send 4,000 bytes. And to keep things simple, let's say it sends 1,000 byte per segment. So in this diagram, you see there are four segments. It transmits the first segment, and that takes time to get across to the server. And how much more is it allowed to send? It's allowed to send 3,000. The limit was 4,000. We've just sent 1,000. So we're allowed to send another 3,000. So let's send it in three more segments. So the client transmits these three segments out onto the network. After sending those, this is one, each of 1,000 bytes in length. After sending those 4,000 bytes, we're not allowed to send any more because the window now is down to zero. I could initially send 4,000. I've sent 4,000. I'm allowed to send zero more bytes. Now, these segments take some time to get to the server. So it takes some time to get there. I'll try and follow this diagram. When the first one arrives at the server, let's assume the server processes it immediately and sends back an ACK. It's going to come back later. Sends back an ACK. So what have we got? The buffer here, it's hard to draw, but initially the 1,000 goes into the buffer. And then, assuming the application takes that 1,000 immediately out, we have that extra 1,000 bytes of space available. So we send back an act saying you can send 1,000 more bytes. And the same will happen for each of these segments. And an act will come back. And from the client's perspective, here we're not allowed to send any more. We've reached our limit. We must wait until we get an act saying we're allowed to send more. And in general, the act will allow us to send more data and keep going until we get the diagram like we have on the screen. We can send four more segments, for example, and then wait send four more. This is the example, or in this example, the window is fixed at 4,000 bytes, which effectively means we can send 4,000 bytes, wait for the acknowledgement for the first of those segments, which will allow us to send another 1,000 bytes. When we receive the first one, we can send 1,000 more. We send that, and then we receive the next act allowing us to send another 1,000, and the next, and effectively we can send four more segments of 1,000 bytes, then we'll have to wait, we send four more, and so on. And if we've got continuous amount of data, that pattern will continue. What's our throughput, or how would you measure the throughput in this case? What does it depend upon? How fast is data getting delivered to the server? It depends upon the data size. In the diagram, look at how fast, how often is data getting to the server? One round. Yeah, in, in one round trip time, which is here, and then to get back, we're receiving four segments. Or going, stepping back, we're sending four segments every one round trip time. And because nothing is lot lost, if we send four segments, the server will receive four segments. So we send, the client sends four segments, 
then the time to get the data there and act back, our round trip time, then we can send another four segments and in that one round trip time. So effectively we get to send four segments every one round trip time. A round trip time is the time to get one segment there to the server and to get an act back. And if we keep drawing this diagram, it'll be the same. Four segments every one round trip time. And that's also the rate at which we receive, because nothing's being lost. If we send at that rate, we receive at that rate on average. So we receive four segments every one round trip time. And that gives us our throughput. Our throughput depends upon how many segments we can receive per round trip time. In this case, our window was a maximum size of 4,000. I just made that up for this example. Four segments, for example. If that window was larger, let's say it was 8,000, we'd get this. With 4,000, or four segments, we can send four, and then we have to wait, because there's a long round trip time. But if we had 5,000, for example, we could send one, two, three, four, and then another one here. We'd have a smaller amount of time waiting. If we have 6,000, then even a smaller amount of time waiting. 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, if that was the window size, then at some point we'll get to, we're always transmitting. We don't have to wait for an ACK because we're still sending part of the window. And here's an example where we have what? It's eight segments, 8,000. We can send the first one. We're allowed to send another seven, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight. But while we're sending the seventh, we're allowed to send one more, but we receive an act for the first, allowing us to send another one, which means we can now send number eight plus another one. So we send seven, eight, and if you look, when the act for the second segment comes back, allow us to send another segment. So if we keep going, we'll always be able to send segments. We won't have to wait for an act. There'll be no waiting time in this case because the window size is large enough relative to the round trip time. So let's just make note of some things that we know. We have an advertised window. That is the limit as to how much the, the source is allowed to send. The maximum advertised window is the maximum size of the buffer at the receiver. In this example on the board, I said the buffer was 10,000 bytes. The maximum advertised window is 10,000 bytes in that case. So we have an advertised window, sometimes abbreviated as AWND. We will see later there are different types of windows, a congestion control window. We know round trip time, RTT, the time to get a segment to the destination and then get one back. And, okay, of these two diagrams, which one is better in terms of throughput? This one with four segments, or this one with eight segments? Hands up for four. Hands up for the eight. Okay, so in, with four segments, I send four segments, and this time I'm not sending anything. I've got a network, I'm not using it to transmit data. That's inefficient. I'm sending four segments per round trip time. That's worse than sending eight segments, or it's slightly less than eight segments per round trip time. In this case, I don't spend any time waiting. I spend all the time transmitting, more efficient. Let's put some, try and derive an equation that relates all these factors together. So what is the round trip time? Well, the time from when we start transmitting the first segment 
first data segment until we get an act back. That's our round trip time. So shown on the diagram, here's one round trip time. And the advertise window is the amount that we're allowed to send. In my example, I said it was 4,000 bytes. But in general, let's say it's AWND, the advertise window. That's how much I'm allowed to send, how many bytes I'm allowed to send per round trip time. And then there we have a rate. Advertise window is measured in bytes. Round trip time, bytes or bits. Round trip time in seconds is a unit time. And how fast can we deliver data across the network is our, the rate at which we can send. If we simply have a link, it's the transmission rate of that link. So we also have a rate, let's say, in bytes per second or, or bits per second or with some prefix. So a measure of performance is how much time do we spend transmitting our data per round trip time. Let's derive an equation on our on the board. So just to giving some notation we're going to use in, in some equations. We have our round trip time. Uh, advertise window is how much we're allowed to send. And some rate, the, the speed at which we can send data. For example, if I have a 100 megabit per second link between my two computers, the rate is 100 megabits per second. And the advertise window depends upon the buffer size at the server, at the receiver. The maximum value, for example, here may be 10,000 bytes. Now, you, most of you said that this case is better than this case. In this simple example, sending, f sorry, this case is worse than this one. That is, sending four segments per round trip time is less efficient, gives us less, a lower throughput, than sending eight segments, or having window size of eight, which allows us to send continuous stream of segments. The question that becomes important when we look at the performance of TCP is how large should the window be to give optimal performance? What if, so in this case the window is four segments or 4,000 bytes, whatever units you want to use. What if the window was just one segment or 1,000 bytes? Would we get optimal performance? It, I will not draw it, but if the window was 1,000 bytes, using our similar example, is the performance going to be higher or lower than what's on the screen? All right, try again. Hands up for higher. That is, if the window is 1,000 bytes, the one on the screen, the window is 4,000 bytes. Okay. If under the same conditions, but the window was 1,000 bytes, do you think the throughput or efficiency will be higher than 4,000? Anyone? Higher? If we use 1,000, if we use 1,000, we'll get higher performance. Anyone? What about lower performance? Okay. As you can see, just remove these three frames. If we just have one, then we send one, we wait a long time, send another one. Wait a long time, send another one. That's less efficient than sending four. Okay, so window of 1,000, low, or the lowest. 4,000 is better than 1,000 in this example. 5,000, better again. Okay, because we'd spend less time not sending. And if you could imagine 6,000 or six segments, the diagram here is 8,000. 
And in this case, we're sending all the time. No time waiting. In this case, we've got the best scenario. There's no time spent waiting. We're always transmitting, ignoring other overheads. We get 100% efficiency. What if we set the windows 10,000? Performance will be higher, lower, or the same as the screen. The screen is for 8,000 if we set it to 10,000. Ten, we've got three options now, higher, lower, or same. 10,000, higher, higher performance, higher throughput, higher efficiency. Lower, or well, we see, look at the trend we have here. With the low values, we get lowest performance. Just 1,000, not good. 4,000 was a bit better, 8,000 even better. But what about 10,000 compared to 8,000? Here's 8,000 on the screen. What if we've got 10,000? It will be the same. With, in this case, with 8,000, we're always, in this specific example, we're always transmitting. The round trip time is such that we receive the ACK for the first frame while we're still sending that first set of eight segments of 8,000 bytes. Yeah? Uh, when I say this window is 1, 4, 8, or 10,000, let's say that the buffer size is 1, 4, 8, or 10,000. This value here will come from the size of the buffer. So another way to think of it, what if the server had a buffer of 1,000? What if it had a buffer of 4,000? A buffer 8,000 or 10,000? If it was 1,000... If the buffer size of the server was 1,000, the source would be allowed to send 1,000 bytes at a time. That's a window of 1,000. If it was 4,000, we'd allow to send 4,000 bytes at a time per round trip time. 8,000 is better than 4, as we can see on the, screen, or on the two diagrams. 10,000 is no better than 8,000 because... With 8,000, we've already reached the optimal where we're always sending. We cannot send any faster. Okay? It's about not spending any time waiting. 100,000. 8,000, 10,000, 100,000. All the same. Okay? So increasing above some point does not give us any better performance. What point? At what point do we get this optimal performance? That's what we want to know. What should the value be here such that the sender is always sending? Find an equation for that. So let's summarize again. We have optimal performance when the sender is always sending, no time waiting, like in the example on the screen. That's optimal. Under what conditions do we get that? Under what conditions is the sender always sending? And consider our parameters. Advertise window round trip time and rate. And using those three parameters and what we show here, the advertised window divided by the rate is the time spent sending data. The round trip time is the total time. So the optimal performance is when the advertised window divided by the rate, that is the time spent sending data, is greater than or equal to the round trip time. Okay. when this part is greater than or equal to this part. Because if you, see, if you could imagine this was larger, 
the advertised window divided by the rate was larger, we'd spend no time waiting, all time transmitting. If it's larger than the round trip time. If it's less than, then we will not get the optimal performance. If it's greater than, we'll get the optimal performance. And that's an important uh, part in understanding TCP performance. Any questions on that? So this, this requirement or this, this goal is we would like to have the adver advertised window divided by the rate, the rate at which we can send data, greater than the round trip time of our network. If that's the case, using the flow control mechanism, we'll always be sending data. And that gives us our optimal performance. If we ignore things like errors and so on. But if, if advertised window divided by rate is less than the round trip time, like in this diagram, you can see this arrow is less than this, then we spend some time waiting, which is less than optimal performance, suboptimal. Now, when we are using TCP in the internet between our client and server, what can we control between the client and server? So I'm connecting from my client to some server in the US. Of these three parameters, which one can I control? Which one can I change? Can I change the round trip time? Not very easily. The round trip time between my computer and the Facebook web server depends on many factors outside of the control of my computer and the server. It depends upon the physical distance, the links between us, and, and the, the routers between us. So TCP, we cannot control the round trip time. So we cannot change that. It's, it's a given. It's a characteristic of the network. It's hard to predict even. It may vary. When I connect to the Facebook web server, it may be 200 milliseconds. When I connect to the local SIT server, it may be one millisecond. But it's not something we can control. What about the rate? The rate is, in fact, the rate at which we deliver data between client and server. And let's give you an example. Client server, connect them via a 100 megabit per second ethernet link, direct. Later I'll show you, I'll connect my two laptops via a LAN cable. And using 100 megabit per second, that's the characteristic of my LAN card, the speed at which you can send, then we'd say the rate of this network is 100 megabits per second. Okay, that's the rate at which I can send data. What about a more complex scenario, though? That's if I connect two computers directly together. What if I connect to a router via 100 megabit per second LAN, and that router connects to a server via a, a 10 megabit per second LAN cable, an old LAN cable, only supports 10 megabits per second? What is the rate at which I can transfer data from client to server? I can send to the router at 100 megabits per second. The router can send to the server at 10 megabits per second. What's the average rate at which I can send data from client to server? Calculate it. Anyone can calculate the answer? 10. 10 megabits per second. We're limited by the lowest of the rates in the, of the links in the path. Even though I can send at 100 to the, ser to the router, the router can only deliver that at 10 megabits per second to the server. So data will be queuing up at the router and being delayed and sent. So therefore, on average from client to server, the rate will be 10 megabits per second. It's the minimum of all the rates in the path. We say this is the bottleneck, the bottleneck link in our path. 
Here's our path from client to server with two links. The path rate is effectively the minimum of the link rates in that path or the bottleneck uh, link. More complex, another path with rates of 5, 10, 2 and 7. These are the link rates. What's the path rate? It's two. It's the minimum of those four. Okay. Even though I can send at five to here, we're limited by this. This is the bottleneck. And that's what's used here in this rate equation. Now, my client here, Facebook web server in the US, these are the link rates. Can I control them? No, I have no control over what they are. So again, that's a characteristic of the network, the path between client and server. The round trip time, I cannot control what it is. And the rate, I cannot control. Advertise window. That comes back to the buffer size at the server. The buffer size, the advertise window is how much space is in the buffer? If the buffer is 10,000 bytes, the advertise window can go up to 10,000 bytes. It will never go larger. If the buffer size at the server was 100,000 bytes, the advertise window it goes up to 100,000 bytes. Okay, so the advertise window is related to the buffer size at the server, the same as the buffer size at the server. So come back to our equation. We said to get optimal performance, we need this equation to be true. Advertised window divided by rate is greater than or equal to the round trip time. So if you're using TCP and you want to get optimal performance, set the advertised window such that with the given rate and the given round trip time, this equation holds. For a particular network or a particular path, round trip time may be known and the rate may be known. So if I know the round trip time and the rate, make sure the advertised window is a value such that this equation holds. Or in other words, make sure the buffer size at the server is large enough. Let's rearrange this equation. Bring rate to the other side. The advertised window needs to be greater than or equal to, to get optimal performance, greater than or equal to the round trip time times by the rate. Or rate times round trip time. So given a particular path in the internet, which has some round trip time and has some rate, if I bring rate to the other side here, multiply it, then for optimal performance, the advertised window needs to be greater than or equal to the rate multiplied by the round trip time. For example, my round trip time is 10 milliseconds from my client to server. I measure it. And the rate is 6 megabits per second. How big should my buffer be at the server if I want to get optimal performance? So if we know the round trip time and we know the rate of our path, what should the buffer size be at the server to get this optimal performance? Or simpler, what is the advertised window need to be? Multiply the two values together. Rate multiplied by round trip time. 60, and this is 10 to the power of 6, mega. This is 10 to the power of minus 3. So 60,000 bits 
megabits per second multiplied by milliseconds, we get 60,000 bits. So, if my advertised window is greater than or equal to 60,000 bits, we'll get optimal performance, optimal throughput. We'll, we'll get this case where we're always sending. So if my advertised window is, is 70,000 bits, that's good. 100,000 bits, that's good, same performance. 50,000 bits, not good, or at least not optimal performance. What is the advertised window? Well, the maximum size is the amount of space in the buffer at the server. So another thing to say is, if my buffer at the server is greater than 60,000 bits, I can achieve optimal throughput with TCP flow control. If my buffer at the server is less than 60,000 bits, I will not achieve optimal throughput with TCP flow control. Okay, so now we've got back to how big should the buffer be to get optimal throughput? Because the advertised window depends upon the buffer. Any questions before we try and illustrate this with an example? So we're trying to work through that given a, a particular path between client and server, so from my computer to the Facebook web server, some path, so if we know that the the rate of that path is 6 megabits per second and the time to get there and back is 10 milliseconds. That's a characteristic of the network or the, that path that we're using. Then for TCP flow control to make sure the source can always send data and spend no time waiting, the server must have a buffer space for that TCP connection greater than 60,000 bits greater than or equal to. If it's 60,000 bits, that's sufficient. If it's 70,000 bits, that's okay as well. If it's 50,000 bits, we will not achieve our optimal throughput because with the TCP flow control, we'll spend some time sending and then we'll have to wait before we receive an ACK before we can send more, which gives us suboptimal throughput. Uh, if the rate decreases, well, if, so it's about the, the efficiency, not the absolute throughput, but the efficiencies, which is the, if we look at this, it's about the ratio between this line, advertised window divided by rate, this vertical line, and the round trip time, okay, which is a measure of efficiency. How what percentage of the time are we sending? So, yes, if the, if the rate is smaller, if it was 3 megabits per second, we would only need a buffer size of 30,000 bits, a smaller buffer. Uh, we, no, we may get a lower throughput, an absolute throughput, but we're talking about uh, as a percentage of that throughput. So, you're right. If, if the rate is 6 megabits here, our throughput, so that's the sending rate. The throughput is always going to be less than or equal to the sending rate. So if our rate is 6 megabits per second, our throughput can never be larger than 6 megabits per second. The throughput is the rate at which we deliver. What we're saying is that if our sending rate or our path rate is 6 megabits per second and the round trip time is 10 milliseconds and the buffer size at the server is greater than 60,000 bits, it means our throughput can reach 6 megabits per second. 
that is optimal performance. We can be sending all the time, no time waiting. If uh, if let's give some different a different example. If we had our client and server, and like you said, a smaller rate, three megabits per second, same round trip time, ten milliseconds, and if we have the same advertise window, or we could calculate the advertise window or the server buffer space required would be thirty thousand bits. So if our advertise window it's greater than or equal to 30,000 bits, then throughput will be our optimal, 3 megabits per second. But think of throughput as a percent, now think of efficiency, throughput divided by rate. Efficiency in this case is 100%. And here, also 100%. That is, our throughput reaches the, the highest it can go. Yes, the th absolute value of throughput is less, but in terms of what we've got, what we have is 3 megabits per second. We want TCP to use all of that. If we've, we, we know we can go no larger than 3 megabits per second. We want to use all of that. And we're trying to work out what value of advertise window or what value of buffer space is needed to reach this 100% efficiency. If we were lower, let's say, uh, let's say we had, in this case, an advertise window of 30,000 bits. We know what the optimal value sh should be, but let's say we don't have the optimal value. The window is 30,000 bits, or the buffer space is 30,000 bits. Our equation says if the window is greater than or equal to the rate times the round trip time, we can reach the optimal throughput. It's not here, which means we will not get 100% efficiency. We'll be less than 100%. So, Throughput, let's say, will be 3 megabits per second. Whereas in this case, with the same window, 3 megabit per second rate, our throughput's the same, but importantly, our efficiency is higher. So focus on the efficiency, which is throughput divided by the rate. Yes, that's right. When you have a lower data rate, you don't need a you need a you can be okay with a smaller buffer, a smaller window. Yes. Yeah. And similar if you have a lower round trip time. It means your act gets back faster and you don't have to send as much data. So yes, if the rate is smaller or the round trip time is smaller, then you don't need such a large window or such a large buffer at the receiver to get the optimal performance. You're right that in the network there's some relationship between round trip time and rate in practice. But let's assume that they are, they are parameters of the path that we're using. Okay. Let's say the path between client and server, rate of 6 megabits per second, round trip time of 10 milliseconds. Another path, this is from me to Facebook, from me to Google ser server, maybe 6 megabits per second and 20 milliseconds. Then given that, I know what the buffer size should be to get the optimal. That's all we're saying here. So given these values, we can work out what the buffer size should be.
that leads us to something else. What if we don't have the optimal? That is, if the window is less than the round-trip time times the rate. So what we're saying is, what we're saying is, if the advertised window is greater than or equal to the rate times the round-trip time, we get 100% efficiency. We cannot go any better. What if the advertised window is less than the rate times the round-trip time? Like in the slide, the picture on the screen. What's the efficiency in this case? How would you calculate the efficiency in, in the one on the screen? The efficiency is the, the percentage of time that we spend sending data. What percentage of time? How would you write an equation to calculate ef efficiency in this case? As a fraction or as a percentage? Look at the two, again, the two vertical lines. Our efficiency is a ratio between this value and the round trip time. The larger this is, the more efficient we are relative to the round trip time. So this divided by round trip time. Advertised window divided by rate, all divided by round trip time. as a fraction, not as a percentage impact. So, uh, if the top part is greater than the bottom part, then we get efficiency of 1 or 100%. And we cannot go above 1 or 100%. So if this is larger than this, of course, this fraction is greater than 1. And as a percentage, uh, 100% or higher, and of course we're limited at 100% efficient. Because we cannot send faster than the rate. If the advertised window divided by the rate is less than the round trip time, then this will be less than one. We're less than 100% efficient. Okay, let's finish this. Uh, so how do we define throughput? Well, let's write it as, or another way to write efficiency. Throughput divided by rate. I have a, I paid for a six megabit per second link internet ADSL link. My throughput is of that link is 4 megabits per second because there's overheads. Then I would say I'm, my efficiency is 4 divided by 6. So another way to think of efficiency is the throughput divided by the rate. The rate is how fast we can send. The throughput is the rate at which we send the real data. Here, we can now calculate throughput. These Equate these two equations. What do we get? solve. So, first, we said efficiency is the ratio between this advertised window divided by the rate and the round trip time, as per the diagram here. The larger 
This is, compared to round trip time, the more efficient we are. Another form of efficiency, or the way we uh, describe efficiency, is if we have some rate and we have some throughput, then the ratio of throughput to rate is the measure of efficiency of that link. So, equate these two together, they're the same. Calculate throughput. What do we get? The rates will cancel out, won't they? Yeah, you're right. Let's see if everyone knows. So if you cancel out the rates in those two equations, we get window size divided by the round trip time. Equate this with this. M bring rate to the other side. So multiply this by rate. And you get throughput equals all of this multiplied by the rate. And the two rates will cancel out and we'll get left advertised window divided by round trip time. So the throughput is the advertised window divided by the round trip time. And we know optimal throughput, optimal efficiency will be achieved when advertised window is greater than the rate times the round trip time greater than or equal to it. When it's less than, we'll get as calculated as, as shown in this equation, advertised window divided by round trip time. Coming back to one of the examples that I, we have on the board here, if the advertised window is 30,000 bits in our network here, what's the throughput? I made up numbers here. My network has a rate of t 6 mega megabits per second. My network or my path has a round trip time of 10 milliseconds. My server has a buffer size of 30,000 bits. What throughput am I going to get with TCP flow control? We have our, are we going to get, op, first, simpler question, are we going to get optimal throughput? Optimal throughput is when the advertised window is greater than the rate times RTT. Rate times RTT is 60,000 bits. It's not larger. We're not going to reach optimal. What are we going to get? 30,000 bits divided by 10 milli, milliseconds. 3 megabits per second. So, in, in fact, I did calculate it before. Or 50% efficiency. So, let's summarize. This, this equation, and in fact, the multiplica multiplication of rate and round trip time determines how big our buffer size or our advertised window should be. If we're larger than this, we will get 100% efficiency or maximum throughput. If we're less, of course, we'll get lower. And together, this is called the, what's called the bandwidth delay product. Round trip time, think of delay. Rate is sometimes also called the data rate or bandwidth, the speed at which we send out data. So people refer to this as the bandwidth delay product, product multiplication, okay. BDP. The bandwidth, the rate, multiplied by the delay, the round trip time in this case, the product of the two. And it's a common thing, if you know the bandwidth delay product of your path or of your link, then from that you know if my bandwidth delay product is 60,000 bits, then I know my buffer at the receiver needs to be at least 60,000 bits if I want to get maximum throughput. 
So it's commonly used when we're looking at the performance of TCP flow control. These equations and, and a description of this is in the handout. It's slightly different, but I think uh, it leads us to the same same equation. That is, this advertised window needs to be greater than or equal to the rate times the RTT, which is the bandwidth delay product. So now, in, in the internet, when we have a client and server communicating, well, there are many different values of what the round trip time and the rate may be. Some examples. And before we finish, let's see if I have some va values. This is a handout which we'll go through tomorrow. It's just a printout from my website. We'll go through this demo uh, tomorrow. But on one of the pages, there's a sorry, there should be enough. On one of the pages, there's an, a, some example values. So let's just finish on them. The handouts, a, a detailed description of the example or part of the example we'll go through tomorrow. Towards the bottom, there are some there they are. Some example values for some very simplistic links. I have a fast Ethernet link. Fast Ethernet refers to the 100 megabit per second LAN Ethernet standard. For example, I connect my two laptops together. And I'll do that tomorrow. I connect the two laps to laptops, laptops to get to together. <laughs> it's a, too early in the week to be getting so tired. Uh, 100 megabit per second is my rate. Okay. What is the de delay or round trip time between two laptops? Well, you, you can measure it. Let's say it's one millisecond to get there and back. And it's, in fact, usually less. If that's the case, then 100 megabits per second multiplied by 1 millisecond gives us a bandwidth delay product of 12,500 bytes. So there's in bytes. That tells me if I'm using TCP across that link, and with respect to flow control, if I want to get optimal performance, the highest throughput possible, then my buffer at the receiver ignore this value, that's something else, my buffer at the receiver needs to be greater than or equal to 12,500 bytes. Okay? So if I have such a link and I want to get optimal performance, so I know how big my TCP receive buffer should be, 12,500 bytes. If, let's say, I'm using 100 megabit per second LAN, not direct connection, but there's some delays in the switches, so the delay is now 10 milliseconds then the bandwidth delay product is 10 times larger, 125,000 bytes. So in that network, I need a buffer at the receiver to be 125,000 bytes. And another value if I use gigabit Ethernet, one gigabit per second bandwidth. What about your home ADSL? You're connecting to a server via your six megabit per second, or actually downloading from a, a server. So you're, you're the server, in fact. Downloading data. The bandwidth is 6 megabits per second. And let's say the delay, the round trip time, is 50 milliseconds. Then you can calculate the bandwidth delay product or the TCP buffer size needed at the receiver should be at least 37,500 bytes. If it's less, you will not get optimal throughput. You will not get close to 6 megabits per second throughput. If it's greater than or equal, then you can achieve optimal. So just some quick example values. What we'll do tomorrow is go through most of that example in, on that website. Uh, I'll step through on the two computers and demonstrate some different values and a few other things which may be useful for you for the last phase of the assignment.
Let's stop there.